I have a, a Forest Service employee who is in the top of a tree and a pack of wolves is underneath her. Oh my God. And the call came to us, said that she was 30 feet up a tree, surrounded by a pack of wolves, sent in a DNR helicopter. I don't know how long this girl can hang in this tree. When he flew into the area, he did radio that there were wolves on the ground. He could see them. He could see them on the ground. We rescued the girl. She's in our helicopter and heading to OMAC Airport. That is wonderful news. Thank you very much. And our concern is uh, the public safety. Do you think it would change things for people in this area to know that there are wolves here? Yeah, I do. Um, it changes a lot. Um, you know, people no longer feel safe coming out recreating, doing what people love to do. We'll be looking for tracks, we'll be looking for dens, so we'll go to that exact location and try to match up what we know now with the evidence that's out there. I don't want this to become the norm where people are running into wolves or a pack of wolves because things can go bad real quick. They're a predator and they're gonna follow the the deer wherever they go. The trail's relatively easy to get onto, so in theory, anybody could really get back to the area where this young woman was, right? Absolutely. Looking at this trail, it's my opinion that this is this is a well-used trail by hikers and or hunters. It sounded like she had her sat phone. She knew what to do. Uh -huh. um, Not and, everyone, though, would be maybe so prepared if they're just going out for a day hike. Right. Is this something we should just tell everybody? Hey, stay out of this area for now or... I mean, wolves aren't running around, you know, it's not like the movie where it's, they're not running around, you know, hunting down people. Um, but they're an animal. All we're trying to do is just make sure everybody's safe. We do know as of tonight, there are confirmed wolves in this area. We don't know yet exactly how many, but today there were tracks that are confirmed by those state and federal agencies. The Okanagan deputies also found suspected scat in the middle of this road that we were on today. So again, we do know that those wolves have been in this area. As we said, it's about two miles in that direction where they were originally encountered. As for what happens next, it all depends on cooperation between those state, federal, and local agencies. So we now know those wolves are from the Loop Loop Pack, and there are a confirmed at least six to eight wolves within this pack. This is a Washington Fish and Wildlife map that shows their known territory. However, we also know the woman ran into them up here beyond this red circle. So that means their territory, to some extent, is changing. Now, this is an extremely remote area. If you take a look, this is the area where she encountered those wolves. It is well known, heavily used by campers, hikers, and hunters. The good thing is, of course, the woman was safely rescued. However, we were initially told that it took about 14 minutes to get to her. We now know that is not exactly how it happened. In fact, there was actually a great deal of confusion as far as Okanagan County rescuers trying to launch a rescue operation to go get her, but being met with resistance from the state. And as a result, that young woman stayed up in a tree for over an hour. Take a listen. So did Fish and Wildlife have anybody to go? Yeah, they said they have an agent in service up there. They're not exactly sure where he's at, but he okay. is in service in Oakland County. Okay, good. Okay. And they're supposed to, he's supposed to call me back. I, talking to the Forest Service, it's not a Forest Service individual at all. Um, this is actually a search and rescue operation. Okay. So I guess we're requesting Okanagan County search and rescue to go rescue her. <laughs> okay, I don't know that they're able to do that because of a pack of wolves. But what I'm being told is, although she's not actually lost, it is a, a rescue and it would be un fallen under Okanagan County. Okay, and who was it that told you that? Uh, the Forest Service. And when I talked to Fish and Wildlife, they said, nope, that's not search and rescue, that's just us. And no See? helicopter. But For goodness sake, somebody needs to figure it out. And I'm like, I don't know how long this girl can hang in this tree. Seriously. I know. Now, on multiple occasions, search and rescue crews were told by State Fish and Wildlife to stand down. These dispatch documents show how the WDFW repeatedly told the county not to launch a helicopter, saying the wolves are a federally listed species. Dispatchers responded to that, saying they were more concerned for the woman's life than the listed animal. Fish and Wildlife officials then responded by saying the woman was safe up in the tree and that the wolves are doing what they're supposed to do, at one point asking what she was doing there this time of year since it was a known den. And I want to take a second to stop right there because it shows that Fish and Wildlife not only knew the wolves were there, but they also knew there was a den. We also know that wolves will act more aggressively if they are protecting their food sources 
or their pups in and around the den. So now many are saying if Fish and Wildlife knew, why were Okanagan authorities also not informed? Now keep in mind that young woman was still up in the tree at this point. The dispatcher said they didn't know how safe she was though, how strong the tree was, if the limbs would even hold her or how much longer she could hold on. Again, the county rescuers said they had launch approval from the Forest Service and questioned why WDFW was trying to keep them out of the area. In the end, it was a DNR helicopter that landed and flew the woman to safety. But after all of that, there is now a renewed wolf conversation in Okanagan County. Just this week, the county sheriff told me he met with officials from state and federal agencies, as well as county commissioners, to talk about how to better communicate the wolf situation in his county. He says he just wants to keep people safe by letting them know that wolves are now in the area. It's kind of frustrating as the sheriff um, in the county. We have wolves, you know, and they are federally protected, so we don't know anything about them. Um, you know, they tell you these are the numbers, but we are, we are blacked out, so we don't know where they're at. We don't know how many. We don't know where the packs are. The sheriff wants signs posted at those area campgrounds and trailheads so visitors know to carry protection with them, whether it's bear spray or a gun. He tells me Fish and Wildlife did promise to start informing county commissioners of wolf activity in the county and also to start posting signs in those campgrounds and on those trailheads to let people know of the potential dangers. However, they did not say when that work will actually get started. For now, I'm Whitney Ward, Crime 2 News. So we first found elk, it was down on that ridge down there. This is part of the land that Ron Eslick and his family have been grazing their cattle now for about 30 years. It's a combination of state and federal land, about 13,000 acres. Right now we are standing in what is considered the Togo Pack territory. Ron tells me that his family has been grazing cattle here for more than three decades and have had very few problems, but that's all started to change just in the last few years. When my wolf get a hunger pain, he's going to fill it. Raising cattle in Ferry County has never been easy. So how long has your family been up here on this land? Since, uh, 47. But for Ron Eslick, it's never been harder than right now. They had that there, wolf killed that calf over there. All my cows was right here in a tight circle right here. He tells me he's lost three calves just this year to wolf attacks. And that was all scuffed up there or she's fighting it off. In May, it was a week's old calf killed right along the fence line near his property outside of Kettle Falls. Just seven miles south of the Canadian border, he is deep in Washington wolf country. They might be watching us from right up here. There are 22 confirmed packs in the state, about 120 wolves, nearly half of them right here in Ferry County, <coughs> where many ranchers have been grazing cattle for generations. What does it mean for you business-wise when you lose a calf? like that? About $1,400. Does it? Why turn them out here? Well, it's, why turn them out here? Yeah. Because that's, that's the thing to do. It's the thing to do? <laughs> but would it be safer if they were in a pasture? Yeah, but then that's, that's more expensive. And, okay. And without the wolves, you didn't have to worry about it. But now he does worry about it, and so do dozens of other livestock producers who typically turn their cattle out in the spring to roam free on huge, densely forested grazing allotments from the U.S. Forest Service. So how many cows do you still have out there today, do you think? I, got, I should have a dozen out there. The problem is, in deep woods like these, cows tend to scatter, making it harder for them to cluster together and protect themselves from wolves. Could they be anywhere on any of these peaks around us? Yes. That togo pack could go clear down the big bowl. On this day, Ron let me ride along as he checked on his herd. It was in a herd. But over 13,000 acres, we only found tracks, not a single cow. Weeks later, he tells me they all came in except one another loss he attributes to wolves. What do you say to the people who say, what do you expect these wolves to do? Because we're out in their territory. Well, what I say to them is they don't know the situation. They don't know what's going on here. I seen their tracks. He tells me what's going on is the wolves are thriving. <coughs> while small family run cattle operations like his are going extinct. And somewhere in these woods, gray wolves and cows are trying to coexist. 
but only one is a protected species under the active management of Washington's Department of Fish and Wildlife. And you guys are often seen as just anti-wolf, right? Yeah. You just want to kill them all, right? Yeah. And is that necessarily the case? No, no, that's not really the case. I, because we didn't ask for them to come in. We didn't want them to come in, but what do you do? Do you think that there's a place for them in this area? No. No? No. But they're already here, so now what? Yeah, we just got to put up with it, don't we? We got to change our ways, probably. And for Ron, he's already changed. Next year, he's planning to sell the majority of his cows, and for the few that he keeps, he'll graze them off of the range, away from the wolves. She got a droopy ear, and I was going to sell her. He says right now it's the only way in Ferry County to have both. I think we'll all survive. Yeah. The wolves, too? Yeah, they will, too, definitely. He just doesn't know at what cost. So while it's clear that the current system is not working for ranchers like Ron Eslick, the other side of this wolf issue is from environmentalists who say it's not working for the wolves either. And that's why some are looking to a grazing allotment like this one. We're still on U.S. Forest Service land. It's the Colville National Forest. But as you can see, it is much more open. And the hope is that both sides will agree this works better. But well, we don't want to force the ranchers off. Mike Peterson is the executive director of the Lands Council. I first met him last year to talk about the Colville A to Z project, where environmentalists and loggers came together to help prevent wildfires. Do you consider yourself an environmentalist? Absolutely. Now he's hoping to help save Washington wolves by working with Washington cattle ranchers. And you have found some great success on the forestry side working with two different sides that originally the thought of coming together was unthinkable. Do you think you can recreate some of that success for the wolf issue? I think so because, but it takes a while. Um, we'll follow the same pathway. You got to meet face to face. You got to build trust. You've got to find common ground. For the Lands Council, that common ground might just be restoring the actual ground. Ranchers need certainty. They have a, have a place for their cattle in the summer months and they need to have forage and they would like some certainty that they're not getting munched on by wolves. This Recreate Meadows, Restore Meadows provides a pathway to that certainty. There's more misinformation than there is good information. That's where Chris Bachman comes in, the Lands Council Wildlife Program Director. You know, the Smack Out Meadow is, is a great example of what we could actually have if we restored former meadows. Smack Out Meadow is right in the heart of the Smack Out Wolf Pack territory. It's part of a traditional U.S. Forest Service grazing allotment, but it offers something most other allotments don't. You have a place here where you have cattle that you can see where they are. You can count them from a distance even. If there's any movement on the, in the tree line that's wolves coming in, you can see them and observe and protect your livestock. It's why the Lands Council is now looking to duplicate meadows just like these all across the Colville National Forest. A lot of the grazing allotments for U.S. Forest Service and in the Colville specifically look more like this. Yeah. Yeah, the reason they look like this is that our forest has changed over the last hundred years. Mm -hmm and it used to be more open. So now they're poring over old maps and surveys to identify old meadows that are grown over now but could be transformed back into better grazing land for cattle. Often on many of the same grazing allotments ranchers are already using. So if you could restore some of the meadows on their same allotments, do you think that that would make it easier for them to buy into the idea? And I think, that, yes, I think that's what we'll look for. Some of these allotments are start at very low elevation and go way up to the peak of the kettle crest, for example. So there's a big, huge area. If it's a 50,000 acre allotment, say, could we restore 5,000 acres, acres and the cattle have enough food right in that one area? I think that's possible. When the state first established a wolf recovery plan in 2011, it outlined what to do when wolves attack cattle, including killing certain wolves if there are three attacks within 30 days or four in 10 months. But both Mike and Chris say the state's own actions are proof that plan isn't actually fixing the problem. He points just a few miles to the north where the entire Profanity Peak wolf pack was taken out in 2016, Today, a new pack has taken its place. And we have the OPT pack, where again, they've removed 
two wolves and my understanding is predations are continuing. Does incrementally removing wolves change pack behavior? You know, at this point, the evidence says no. What about the people who are going to listen to what you're saying and say you're just another pro-wolf guy who doesn't get it? Thank you for asking that because while I believe wolves have their place on the planet and their place in the ecosystem, I come out in the middle. I mean, I'm, I, to me, it's not all about wolves. It's about a healthy environment, and wolves are part of that healthy environment. Mm. But changing minds here will not be easy. Both Mike and Chris say they already know they won't convince every rancher to get on board, but they're confident they will get some. It isn't working to have cows wandering through the thick forest and expecting them to survive. We got to do something different. And they hope that will be enough to get started on a new way of raising cattle and protecting wolves in Ferry County. What's best for everyone in this situation? I'm confident we'll get there. We'll find that answer. So you just heard two very different sides of the same issue. But as Mike said, they will never meet in the middle until they actually meet face to face. So I brought them together face to face. So we're headed up outside of Colville now. So again, we can hear from both sides of this wolf debate. The question has always been, how do we protect Washington wolves at the same time? How do we better protect our Washington cattle ranchers? So let's go see what we can find. And all we are is out here trying to make a living. We don't want to move into town. Ron Eslick is a lifelong cattle rancher in Ferry County. There's all this fight with the environmentalists about uh, getting rid of these wolves, the poor little cute little things that kills my cute little calf. He believes wolves don't belong here in Northeast Washington, and he's tired of so-called environmentalists fighting to protect wolves, while he says small-time cattle operations like his are going extinct. They don't know the situation. They don't know what's going on here. There's more misinformation than there is good information. So I went to find one of those environmentalists and met Chris Bachman, Wildlife Program Director at the Lands Council. If what they were doing there was working, we wouldn't continually have the same problem year after year. He prefers calling himself a conservationist and absolutely believes Washington wolves need to be protected, even if they are causing conflict with ranchers. Do I agree that if you are grazing in, in an area where we knowingly have wolves, should you be assuming risk? Yes. Is there room to actually collaborate and compromise? Yes. And that search for compromise is why Chris agreed to meet with Ron. I'm bringing both sides together. They have never met together face to face before, but they agreed to sit down here and talk with us today. We're going to go up and see if we can't find some kind of solution. But to be honest, they were both a little hesitant when we finally came face to face. Just start out from the beginning. What was the objective of bringing wolves into this area? Was it to get all the ranchers off the range? Well, I would start by saying that we're not opposed to the cattlemen. Um, we're certainly, I mean, our goal is that you're not losing livestock as well. Um, but I think there's a, if, a little bit of a misunderstanding. Fish and Wildlife didn't bring wolves back in. It was a natural recolonization from Idaho and from British Columbia. There are more than 120 confirmed wolves living in Washington today. By far the most are living in and around Ferry County. But this map from Washington's Department of Fish and Wildlife actually shows that same area has the least acceptance of wolves in the entire state. Just one more reason why these two sides have drifted farther and farther apart for years. Don't believe everything you hear and half of what you see. When we were here, you talked about the benefits of a place like this, as this historic meadow. Explain how this would work and how something like this could benefit someone like you, Ron. So it's open. You see them herded. You see them bunched together um, in a natural defensive behavior. It doesn't mean that you're fixing all the problems. They had a, at least a 48-hour period where they had wolves in the tree line that were harassing cattle. But in the, in the end, it actually was defensible space. There weren't cattle lost. There weren't wolves lost. Would you be open to that idea? It would not be possible for our range over there in the Kettle Crest. There's no openings like this. It's all timber. What if they made one? Oh, boy. Nature made this one. 
it would be so much work and cost. It would be outrageous. What do you say to that? Could you do this over on, like in the western part of the forest? No, but could you create a meadow that was on the hillside? Yes. You can try this stuff, but you know, a cattleman, if they don't get no calves in one year, two years, they're broke. Would you be open to trying something? Oh yeah, I w well not me because I'm getting too old for that kind of <laughs> stuff anymore. But the younger cattlemen should be. Having heard his frustrations, why are we fighting so hard to protect the wolves when it's very clear that they don't want them here? Great question. And it's worth the fight for me because holistically, I, see, I, I, I recognize the benefit of having apex predators in ecosystems. I think it can be done. Do you think it can be done? It's going to take a while. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. I mean, nothing worthwhile is, right? So, so uh, by the time they get it all taken care of, you might lose a lot of cattlemen. In what way? Well, they can't afford to go out and feed these wolves. Would you say it's worth a try? Well, anything's worth a try. When we first got here, I think I sensed a little bit of apprehension from both of you, wondering how this was going to play out, what this was really going to be like, talking to each other. Do you think that there's some place somewhere in the middle that you guys can meet? Yes, there is. And, you know, you talk about these cattlemen, they're all environmentalists. Yeah. They take better care of the, the forest than what people think they do. We're going to need to figure out and develop a trust between us that we want the same things. We want your cattle to stay alive. It's a different approach from a conservationist where most ranchers in the past have felt the push to get off of public land completely. And we don't want to remove you from the land. There's 2018 and some smart ass decided to bring wolves in and that might do it, see? That's what I'm That's how it feels. Yeah. Do, you, do you really think somebody brought wolves yes. in here? To Washington? Yes. And we could probably go back and forth on that one. Oh all, yeah, all we can. Long. There's. Uh, <laughs> Do you both feel, though, that maybe you've inched a little bit closer to each other? We're actually standing closer. I see that. <laughs> I'm getting cold. It's a good start, right? Oh, Body well. warmth, right? <laughs> I, I know establishing trust and having, I mean, that's the foundation of every relationship. And that doesn't come easy between our two communities, right? There's inherently distrust between oh, our yeah, two communities. So how do we circumvent that? And it's going to take a few special people to actually just say, you know what? Let's try this. Yeah, but I hate to be a punching bag. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. And if you're feeling that way, how do we fix that? Quit punching me. Um, but <laughs> truly, we don't want him to feel like a punching bag, and yeah. we certainly don't want him to perceive that we're throwing the punches. So that's how it all ended, and I think we all walked away feeling just a little bit better than when we first walked in. Of course, there is a long way to go towards solving this problem, but both sides agree We'll get there eventually. You can hear more of their interviews, plus take a look at our slideshow. Just go to krem.com. In the studio tonight, Whitney Ward, Krem2 News.